affirming health care. And we know that LGBTI plus persons, people, and especially trans persons, regularly faces or experiences stigma and discrimination while seeking healthcare services. And so leading to disparities in access, quality, and availability of healthcare. This, however, has heightened during the COVID-19 pandemic and has, a, has had a great impact on mental health issues as well. So we will discuss and unpack this further during our conversation today. So just to give you a brief understanding of who our speakers are and our facilitator, we have Kellen Bueta, who is our facilitator for today from Iranti. We have Elliot Kutzer, who is a community and counseling psychologist. He is passionate about the achievement of equal access to quality health care for all trans and gender diverse folks. Then we have Tempos, who is a director at Matrix in Lesotho and an activist. We also have Gita November from the Wits RHI Clinic. She's the founding member and executive director of Trans Tech SA, um, active activist for the decriminalization of sex work in SA and gender, gender affirming health care for transgender individuals in South Africa. She's currently working as the Western Cape Organization's coordinator for the WITS RHI Trans Health Center. We also have Mwamba. Mwamba is a young African leader who does trans activism to strengthen trans movement in Tanzania for six years now, and is devoted in developing capacity to benefit the rejected, neglected, and stigmatized transgenders or transgender persons in Tanzania. So that would be our panelists for today. I will give over to our facilitator now, um, Kellen Bota. Hello, everybody. Um, hi, yes, as uh, I've been introduced, I am Kellen Bota. My pronouns are she and her, and I work for Iranti in a communications and media capacity. I am a trans woman, and so these topics, like many of you, uh, hit very close to home. I am not going to get too into any of the topics at hand. I think the best way forward is to give the floor to our guests uh, one at a time. Each of them uh, will have a few minutes to speak about their work and the issues they face uh, and that their communities face that they work with. Uh, so I'm going to hand the floor over before we open up into a little bit more of a, a discussion. Uh, could I ask that Gita go first? Hi, everyone. So I'm Gita. Let me put my um, video on quickly. Let me just show you. So I'm currently at work, so I'm doing everything. Um, I'm juggling everything this side. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your space. So like I said, my name is Gita, and I'm the Western Cape um, Operations Coordinator for the Trans um, Health Center in, in the Western Cape, and also the founding member of um, Transtech SA um, and the executive director. So one of the, the, the challenges that we currently, that I'm personally facing the side is that we, gender affirming healthcare is, 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 is a big question currently and specifically with, with regards to, to the fact that um, the way how we wanna affirm ourselves that um, looking also back into the fact that just recently I myself wanted to, to go to Home Affairs to make sure that I wanted to, to change my gender marker and it was communicated to me that that is not on the list of priorities for 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 government to, at this point in time to do so. So now, medically, I've transitioned. I've affirmed myself to the way where I feel that I need to do this now legally. But now I'm also being curbed to that. So that's one of my challenges, and that is only me. So I can just imagine how many other. Um, individuals struggle with the same issue as me. And then also accessing a uh, general healthcare um, in, that, in, the, in the same uh, breath. So basically that is a challenge that I'm in my constituents is currently 
facing with Thank you. Uh, I must say, I myself have also uh, been facing similar issues at DHA. Um, and to me, it just feels that when your trans and the Department of Home Affairs says, during this pandemic, uh, we can't uh, deal with you right now. And when uh, medical centers perhaps rightfully say that because of sanitation and safety concerns or because of limited resources we can't deal with you right now or when the department of basic education uh, is essentially silent on issues pertaining to trans youth in schools because during the pandemic we can't deal with you right now it feels like this is a time when it is affirmed that we as trans people are on the bottom of the rung, the bottom rung when it comes to accessing uh, services to affirm who we are. So with that, I'll hand over to Elliot, who is not a doctor, but is our closest thing right now to a medical expert, having worked extensively uh, to advocate for uh, access to healthcare and working as a psychologist. Uh, Elliot, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kellen. Um, yeah, so, so alas, not a doctor. I'm more interested in people's uh, psychological, psychosocial well-being. Um, yeah, just a note on the, on the IDDHA issues. Um, I myself am in the weird position where my gender marker application is in process. Um, and I'm currently sitting with a name that is not on my ID, but that is my legal name. Um, and I can't sort these things out. So, so yeah, these things. Oh, anyway, so what are the things that I've, I've seen as a, as a therapist? So I work um, also with Gita at the Bits RHI clinic in uh, Belleville. Um, so, so what I've seen in working with, with clients in this time, trans clients specifically in this time, is that so, so, so lockdown and, and the whole pandem pandemic has had a, a very interesting emotional effect on all of us and on, on all people living through it um, in terms of sort of um, triggering very tra traumatic responses for some people, um, in terms of for other people spurring on some deeper self-reflection because you know you have all this time on your own in your own space um if if you are one of the people who, who can afford to do that so 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 there's a lot of um emotional upheaval that that comes around this time and what i've seen among um the trans population is those things are definitely also there, those, those sort of uh, COVID-related stresses or lockdown-related stresses. Um, and how it comes out, I think, is often in a, a sort of a intensified dysphoria or dysphoric experience for many people. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've, I've noticed this from the start of the, of the lockdown. Um, and also, I think for many people, there's also a sense of um, you know what, I've been thinking of going on to hormones for so many years or, or getting my surgery or whatever. Um, and, and contextual stuff has maybe kept them from doing so, but there's something about this time that on the, on the flip side, maybe the not so negative side, that's driving people to, to actually make important decisions for their own well-being at the moment. Um, yeah, so it's so a complex picture, I guess, as as one can expect, but yeah, that's, I think, in short, what I'm seeing in, in my practice at the moment. And uh, I must say, it's obviously not only a South African issue, it's not uh, only here in which uh, the pandemic is affecting trans and gender diverse people. Um, an Iranti staff member actually recently received a message from a Zimbabwean journalist uh, looking to write a story on the limitation or the or the cutting out completely of uh, trans affirming surgeries and other medical care 
uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we live in a region where our identities, uh, not just as trans people, but LGBTI people broadly are often criminalized by government. Um, so I'll say from my end, hearing the story out of Zimbabwe surprised me uh, in terms of knowing that actually uh, services to some degree did exist in Zimbabwe beforehand. Uh, so with that, I would like to speak to uh, Mwamba from TTI in Tanzania. I don't see them in the participant list. Mwamba, if you're here, I would love to hear a little bit about uh, what you do, what TTI does, and what the status of our communities in Tanzania is. I'm going to take that to say that Mamba has not made it to the session, unfortunately. Um, Hi, Kellen. Um, yes. Mwamba has um, technical difficulties due mm. to um, electricity shortage in his country. So um, apologies on his behalf. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, that is unfortunate. Uh, I think it's always important to bring in as many diverse voices as possible into these sessions. Um, I do hope that we will hear from Wamba again at some stage in another session, uh, but pivoting smoothly and swiftly along and reframing what I was going to say. Um, posing to Gita and Elliot before I open up for questions from our guests, um, I said earlier that I feel like with sorry. everything... I'm so sorry, um, Kellen. We do have yes. Tempos, who's also um, a speaker. Tempos Motipeng. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank I'm so you. sorry for, for skipping mm -hmm. over you. Um, please, please go ahead. I, I, feel, very, I feel very rude. Um, please, please do go ahead. No worries. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm Dampwa Simutuping um, from the People's Matrix Association. I'm the executive director of the organization. Um, I've been with the organization since um, 2009. It's been 10, 11 years now. Um, and um, had been leading the organization since um, 2013. So, um, the status of the community in the in Lesotho, um, we have um, a challenge. We're battling with the social and economical um, um, challenges um, for the community in the country, where um, we realize that um, most of the people um, have been uh, seriously affected by the by COVID nineteen pandemic, um, and most of them are have been kicked out of their homes and they're homeless. So um, we're trying to offer emergency support to them, though the organization also um, doesn't have much resources, but we are trying. And we also have, there's also an element of mental illness where we had to engage a psychologist to work closely with the, the, the community. And um, the other issues that we are battling with um, uh, the issues of access to 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 health services, whereas the organization we had to find the ways of um, extending the hand to the community, because uh, most of our community members are uh, they 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 live far from the the facilities. Our facilities are dis are centralized within um, the the townships. So they have to travel long distances to get to um, the facilities. And also that restriction of COVID-19 that also restrict the movement within the country. So it is quite a challenge for the, for the community. And for the economic aspects, most of our community members were, um, in, were working in the space where they earn very low income. And most of them lost their... their, their the, the, the jobs um, due to COVID-19 um, lockdowns and um, pandemic. So um, now um, we are trying to find the ways of um, finding, the, finding the ways of sustaining their income. If uh, 
though it is quite a challenge for us. And um, yeah, it is quite a challenge for us to support the, the, the community, but we are trying where we can. And also there is element of, um, we just, one of, the, of our transgender um, identifying person submitted um, to the ministry um, the, the request for um, change of gender marker. So we are following up with the, on the case. So we're still waiting for the feedback. Um, as for now, can I just leave it there so that when, oh, the main, main issue is around hormones. There's um, high demand in the country and also their, their hormones are scarce and the prices have increased and they are extremely expensive. So it is quite challenging for our community to access the hormones. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry again for, for skipping you out. I also didn't notice your name in the participants list as f at first, but I'm very glad that we did manage to get a speaker from outside of South Africa. Um, I must admit a little bit of ignorance in terms of the situation in Lesotho. Uh, when you say that, you know, there's, there's an issue with access to hormones, um, is that something that has got worse during the, during the pandemic or is it something that has been a long-term issue? Uh, the same with uh, applying to the government to change gender markers. Is that something that has been available to people in Lesotho uh, already or is it something that uh, you are facing heightened challenges with at the moment? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> Actually, um, most of us used to um, buy from South Africa, from around Lesotho, like fixed pack and lady print. And now that we are forced by the situation to stay in the country, it is quite a challenge for us to access them. And, and um, I don't know, but I can't really say that we're limited, but the challenge, we are, we are realizing the challenge now because the demand within the country is, has increased. Um, so I can't really say that we, the stock has decreased or increased. It is just the issue of, of availability and accessibility and also affordability. So I thought the country maybe they, they didn't realize the need. So now there is, the need has increased and they don't know how to, they can't um, supply much or, um, I don't know, but I will just leave it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. But the fact that we have been accessing from South Africa and now we are forced to access it in Lesotho has created also a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, I can imagine that the, the closing up of borders has wreaked havoc, I think, with communities all across the region. Thank you for that. Um, also, just to note to everyone that um, uh, Matrix uh, is one of the SATF members, uh, member organizations in Lesotho, along with uh, Iranti Gender Dynamics and many, many others. And recently, a report did go out. It's a very short, very basic report, just looking into some of the issues uh, faced by community members, faced by activists um, that were just listed there. Uh, so if anyone's interested in looking at a little bit of the stats uh, for the region, uh, that is there as well. I'm going to open it up uh, in a second to anyone who wants to ask questions to our guests. I'm going to ask that uh, everyone raise their hand and then we'll go in that order. Uh, but first, I want to play off of some of the content that we've just heard and pose it back to Elliot and Gita and hear a little bit about what can be done or has been done in South Africa to deal with uh, a lack of gender affirming healthcare and gender affirming services during the lockdown. I do know of at least one story where um, a trans man didn't know how to get permission to cross provincial borders, uh, which means that for a period of lockdown, you couldn't access hormones, uh, similar to the Lesotho case. Um, but Vits RHI, for those who don't know, is busy building up its uh, trans healthcare clinic. So what are some of the things happening on the ground right now uh, to address this issue? Um, 
sorry, my dear. Can you just repeat that question again? I just had a, a loss of connection. Okay, no problem. Um, I'm just asking what is VITS RHI? But I'm also expanding this to Elliot, if you want to come in. Uh, what is happening right now on the ground at your organization to try and expand gender affirming care for trans and gender diverse people during the lockdown and beyond, of course? So, um, Callan, to be, to, to, be, to be brutally honest with regards to that, I don't know. Because currently at this moment, let me just put on my camera for you. You see my beautiful self. So um, <clears throat> currently at this moment is that we have a, a five-year grant that will end in September 2023. So beyond, I don't know. So currently we have it in four provinces that is in in the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Gauteng. It's in three pro and Nelson Mandela Bay. So um, currently we're only serving within that specific metros. So our funding is not um, that we can expand beyond any other borders. So what we have, we do have, like for instance, I can speak specifically for the Western Cape. So we have people coming from, um, from outside our, our, of our Cape Town Metro to access our gender, uh, gender affirming healthcare. But currently um, we are also, so we don't have this, the same rigid processes as to what our, our, like what, for instance, like Grotesque Hospital Lab, where you have to do like a gazillion uh, psychological uh, sessions where you have to, before you can then um, start with um, gender affirming healthcare. But we do have guidelines that we, we, we use to make sure that we, we, we um, access this, these uh, gender affirming healthcare. But I can speak as an activist specifically with regards to say sustainability. I really don't know beyond the, 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 the next five years what's going to happen because we do have a, a very good uh, dip, um, a, a memorandum of understanding with the Western Cape um, um, Department of Health with regards to providing us with this um, gender affirming um, medication. So that is currently where we're at with VITS. So, and that is truth be told. I don't know, maybe Yalit wanna also jump onto that um, wagon uh, while I'm here on that topic. Um, yeah, so, so I can't say as much about the whole VITS RHI thing as Gita can. Um, I'm not that involved in the, in the organization. But what I can say, Kaylin, just to kind of address your question more broadly, what, what is happening currently is that there is firstly a process of developing gender affirming healthcare guidelines for the country um, that is currently underway. Um, so I, many of you may know that there is currently no specific guideline or standard operating procedure or anything in that sort of vicinity for South Africa, for the South African context. So it's a really, um, it's a really great opportunity to develop something that's that speaks to our context, um, that, that, that does things in a, in a South African global South majority world kind of way. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is um, I, with, uh, along with, um, or actually uh, I'm being paid by Gender Dynamics to do the following, working as a consultant with Gender Dynamics to do actually um, healthcare affirming, uh, gender affirming healthcare training for, for doctors and medical professionals, but also for trans people, because um, what we're working towards ultimately is an is a informed consent model um, where, where you access the services that you need. Um, and, and an informed consent model requires a, a, a sort of a patient base that, that can engage with medical professionals um and so yeah so so our training is is very broad in that it it touches on both sides hopefully enabling some conversation and hopefully changing the face of gender affirming healthcare um down the line hopefully soon hopefully like it's a magic program and everything is like this and it's magic but probably not but i mean yeah always good to stay hopeful Okay, um, with that said, because a good facilitator is not one who talks the whole time, but who facilitates, 
Uh, I'm opening up the floor to anyone who has questions. Uh, let's keep it civil. Uh, raise your hands and then I'll call on you individually um, to ask your question. If no one has any questions, I will pose another one. Uh, and this is perhaps, oh, uh, we have one from Roche. Roche, would you like to speak? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to always be part of these conversations. I mean, um, I come from an organization that doesn't necessarily provide um, gender affirming healthcare services, but it's also always great to know in terms of what is available and also, um, you know, information sharing. So it's just um, the one thing that I wanted to pick up with Elliot is, you know, that SOP, how is it being um, put together? Who is involved in creating um, these standard operating procedures? And is there a measure of involvement from for instance, NGOs that are not particularly offering the services, but that they can also be involved just to be um, attuned to the kind of things that um, are necessary in trans healthcare specifically. And then the other thing is um, in terms of, you know, sustainability, I also just want to do to, to ask around that, you know, I've been, I've, I'm pretty new to the NGO sector as a whole, and this model of funding, and um, it's, it's, for me, it's very exploitative and capitalist, you know, knowing that you have to also then produce a certain amount of numbers to, to justify um, your funding, and so, the lived, lived experience of people becomes a measure of data and not necessarily, um, you know, a concern for key and how we can mitigate that as a sector um, together. And I know this is probably a question that's been asked numerous times, but um, I'm also interested in that because I just feel um, there's so many things that come with that and how we also hold our our government um, accountable in that sense. I feel like they've just gotten a, you know, they've been exempt from this conversation. Yes, they contribute to discussion and policy and we know policy takes long, but then in other ways, how do we put pressure on our government to say, besides, you know, the, the, medic the medication and medicalizing, um, you know, LGBTI people, you know, um, how do we put pressure on them to, to, to help um, or create a measure of visibility of the necessity of the involvement. So those are just the two things that I want to do um, bring to the fore. I, respond. I can respond to the first bit, Trisha. Um, I don't know if Gita could maybe respond to the second bit. Um, nice to hear your voice. Um, so, so I'm assuming you said SOP, but I'm assuming you're talking about the guidelines that I spoke about? Elliot, the guidelines. Um, so the guidelines process, um, oh, there's a bunch of medical professionals involved. Some of us are trans. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure I can give you a list. There's, it's, there's no secrets around it. It's hosted, the process is hosted by the HIV Clinician Society, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so they're dealing with the administrative stuff and, and so on. Um, and then there are, uh, there's some um, NGO involvement also. I, for example, Anil from, from GDX is part of that, um, that group. Um, and then, yeah, some of us like myself are, are unaffiliated. I'm a, I'm a consultant, um, Dr. Anastasia Thompson, also unaffiliated consulting so so it, it is a relatively broad thing so so the way we envisioned the process and, and so we started this process about a year ago almost now um, and the way we envisioned this process was from the start to to really and uh, get community um, involvement through our partnerships with um, NGOs but um, before we could set up those things, uh, lockdown came and turned most of our com committee into frontline responders and 
So, so our timelines have shifted. Um, we are very committed to actually engaging with community members. I think which is why we've also not rushed to push this through in this time. Um, because this this is very important, and, and those of you who know me and who who's worked with me before know that this is something I'm also quite passionate about. So so that's sort of my also what I advocate for there. Um, but this it is very important to us, and so so we it's a slow a slower process I think than than we have hoped for very many reasons, and I don't know where we are at in terms of setting up community consultations, I'm, I don't work with that part of the, uh, or, yeah, that's, that's not my, <laughs> my lane. Um, but yeah, so mm, if that answers your question, Risha, I don't know. Um, I think it did, Elliot, but um, I suppose my problem is also this divide in the sector of you know, that if we call ourselves an LGBTI organization, um, there needs to be a measure of information sharing, um, whether you are active participant or if you are just referring, so that there is a measure of sensitivity um, around affirming health care that you can mm. speak to as well, you know, and that's kind of my, my, my call, like this call for at least um, awareness amongst the sector. So I think um, the people that are involved are obviously very equipped to handle the process, but um, you know, I also just would hope that they would, it wouldn't be contained in, the peop in relation to the people that are currently just um, you know, service providers in, in affirming health. Yeah, and, and like I said, I can't comment too much on that process because I don't know too much about it or that side of the process. Um, but but yeah, absolutely hear you. So yeah. Um, I, before I jump into some of the questions that we've received in the chat, Gita, would you like to address uh, any of Roche's points or questions? So I think, uh, Kellen, so I think, Rishé, I, Rishé, so I think um, Elid has, has specifically has touched on, on many of the things. I can say exactly the same to that because I know that the process has been, um, they, a lot of people has been, of the sector has been um, part of this selection processes, but um, I'm also um, at the point where Elliot is, so um, most of the things go through uh, at the top levels and then it was just filtered down to us on, on, the, on, the, on the ground. So I can't really specifically give you information with regards to that it, uh, itself. So I'm, I'm in the same boat where Elliot is currently. Thank you, Gita. Uh, going through the questions, uh, I, I see a few in the chat. Um, Firstly, to Kay, who asked if DHA is currently taking gender marker change applications. I can say it seems the answer is no. Um, waiting period is already quite long uh, under normal circumstances, but uh, it seems from our research that they, they just will not do it until either level two or level one. Um, they themselves do not seem sure. So uh, I share your frustration with that. Um, I see a couple questions. I'm going to go uh, in order that they came in. And uh, this question then I would imagine is for Gita from Sibusisu. Uh, did WITS RHI experience an influx due to Greta Skier's cancellation of appointments? Uh, and then the next question, uh, which I'll just pose now uh, to save time and then the next person can jump onto that. Is it possible to look at a Trans Health Without Borders initiative, uh, says Jabu Haibos uh, at Iranti, uh, so that we can support each other better, like telemedicine or some other kind of uh, transnational approach? So I suppose that would be a question uh, for all of our panelists here. Uh, so, yeah, Gita, has there been an influx? Uh, Kellen, so um, yes, actually we did. So currently from um, the end of March up until now, 
we have seen, we have started about 120 trans individuals on HRT. And from that 120, we can say um, about 45% is from Hrotiskia. And then the others is been, um, you, the other uh, 55 you can, it is between organizations such as uh, Gender Dynamics, it has um, referred people as well as Triangle Projects, it has been really amazing in also doing referrals. So yeah, there was a, a great influx of, 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 of people coming. And I must say, hearing the word trans health without borders, that is amazing. It gives me goosebumps just to think about it because that will be super amazing. But yeah, that, I hope I've answered that question. Um, I think so. Spil Cesar, do you want to jump in and uh, expand on the question if it hasn't been answered? Otherwise, we'll chat a little bit about a Trans Health Without Borders project. Okay. I'll, th I'll throw that, I suppose, uh, to Tom Porsa at uh, Matrix in Lesotho. Um, but of course, please all panelists, feel free to uh, assist in putting out information or assisting to brainstorm. Um, perhaps first I'll give the floor to Jabu who posed the question if you want to expand a little bit on it. I see that we also have uh, Lecha Bibo who is uh, one of the partners in Botswana in attendance and they also note that they uh, do have a project uh, around access to affirming healthcare as well. So we've got a nice intersection of regional voices. Um, so I think let's just have a discussion on that. Um, hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, look, I think it's been like one of the ideas that I've been having and I think with others about how do we make sure, I mean, this pandemic shows up in a lot of crisis ways for us as trans people and in different contexts in, in our respective countries. And for me, it's a, it is a question of like, how can we collectively across our countries uh, really look at um, providing hormonal therapy, providing psychosocial care, um, you know, et cetera, because there are other medical uh, places that do that, like Doctors Without Borders, uh, medicine, sans français, and so on. So I'm thinking that are there ways for us as trans people to think about uh, trans health beyond our borders? Um, you know, uh, you, one can hear, of course, South Africa, we've got a lot of challenges, but, of, you know, of course, in comparison, we are the, one of the, you know, we are beyond more privileged than other countries within our, in our Southern African region. So that was the one thing about just thinking that through and how do we think that through as a collective, um, be it policy support, be it medicine support, care support, you know, things like that. So that our solidarity has a far deeper reach in that sense. Thanks. Thank you. I see Anil has raised their hand uh, from GDX. Do you want to jump in? Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm just following on from, uh, it's, it's, I'm kind of taking us back a bit, I'm just following on from what um, Elliot had said with regard to the um, guidelines process. Just to say that I've been working a bit with the HIV Clinician Society on the community engagement process. I'm going to put my email address in the chat and if there's any organizations that would like to be included in the community consultation. We've already got quite an extensive list. We've been drawing up a list of organizations to include, and we've got quite a long list. But just to make sure that we don't miss anyone, um, I'm going to put my email address, and if anyone wants to get involved with that, uh, please send me an email and I will add you to the list. We're going to be consulting via Zoom meetings and via Facebook. We're setting up a Facebook page at the moment. So um, uh, that's all going ahead and we'd like to include as many people as possible because this is very, very important. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to pose another question or a new comment or uh, expand a little bit about, about this uh, young idea of trans health without borders? I personally find it to be a vital effort that has to be adopted. Uh, obviously the ways in which that happens 
would have to be fleshed out. But when you take the example from Lesotho, where literal physical borders are now preventing trans and gender diverse folk from accessing hormones, um, I would say cross national and regional partnerships are absolutely vital. Uh, so yes, uh, yes, Tampos, Tamposo, would you like to add something? I see your hand is up. Yeah, actually, I was going to say exactly what you just said, um, because for us, um, it was the issues around strengthening partnerships um, with um, the communities in South Africa, just to ensure that we sustain our supply. So true, not only on hormones and also for binders, because most of people, the demand are high in the Soto, but um, like supply is very low. So um, we rely heavily on South Africa. So I think the issue of um, starting off uh, on uh, with um, strengthening our collaborations, especially with the, the, the communities around um, the borders of the Soto in Bloemfontein, um, Free State and um, these other parts around around Lesotho that would be very helpful. So I, I yeah, that is that is just my idea around it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to remind everyone about what Anil has just said that anyone who wants to be involved in community consultations on the guidelines can contact advocacy1 at genderdynamics.org.za. It's just been posted in the group chat. Uh, does anybody else have any other statement, any question, any concerns? Um, I would also open this up. I don't want to put any organizations on the spot, but uh, there are representatives from, you know, uh, quite a few organizations who I know are doing uh, work in their own backyards. Uh, not literally, but uh, in, in their regions, in their communities. Uh, I'm happy to open it up to anyone who wants to talk about the work that they're doing uh, to ensure access to gender affirming care for trans people. Uh, if no one has a specific question, um, we do still have 15 minutes left. So uh, if you want to do some shameless self-promotion, uh, you're welcome to do so. We are Kazi from Zimbabwe, based on your image. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to pose a question to, um, I don't know if it's Elliot from Vets HRHI. Uh, Gita is from Vets RHI, and Elliot okay, yes. uh, is a freelance. Elliot's everywhere. Okay, <laughs> okay, it's Gita. Okay, Gita. So I'm currently um, okay. I'm not from Zimbabwe. First of all, <laughs> I'm from the Free State, um, in oh. a small Dorby, your um, Orindale service. Um, I also study in Bloemfontein. Um, so what I wanted to ask um, was uh, that I'm currently housing um, three um, transgender individuals in my house, right, and. The problem with, that we're currently facing is access to, um, you know, um, gender um, 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 affirming medication. And what I wanted to, to find out from Gita is, is it possible um, for people to kind of get um, the medi medicine courier to them to like rural places? Because where we are, there's no clinics or hospitals that give access to gender affirming medication, one. And also, how does one go about that process? If, it is indeed available. Thank you. Okay, uh, so yes, so one of the things is um, Korea, it's it's going to be a little bit of a difficult situation at this current moment in time, it's a no, uh, because one of the things is you need to understand that you need to, it's a medical process, so you need to be seen by a, a medical officer, as well as we need to do a, a baseline work such as bloods. So we need to draw bloods to, we, we need to make sure that uh, your creatinine as well as your liver function, everything is right before you can start almost. And then we also, um, like with the, with the guidelines, we, 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 we would like to, to also for you to, to see like Elliot is our, our seasonal um, psychologist to 
to, to have a session, but that is not to say that Elliot is going to say to gatekeep you to say, listen, you you you're not a you won't go on on hormones. So um, currently, so it is. It would be really great if you can, for instance, go to your nearest clinic to get all that blood work done, and and then you can have a, like a, a virtual conversation with our medical officer who will then. Um, start with the medication but there is a discussion that still needs to be taken that still needs to happen within the space of vets who is currently providing these um uh, services to the trans community so at this current point in time we can't but what we do is of what we found with regards to when we got people from the Hrithis gear. So some of the people within the Western Cape, they also attend local clinics. So what we will do is we will then write out a referral letter to go to your local clinic to, if they have this medication on code, then you will then transfer out into that clinics where we, that is trans friendly to, to, to get that. Because most of these medication are on code in, 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 in in our, our own department of health. So, but the problem is not everyone is um, educated. There's not, not that, you must understand, endocrine is a specialized field. So um, not all the, the, the GPs or the doctors at the clinics understand how to treat uh, um, um, patients that that need um, specific treatment when it comes to endocrine. So, yeah. So that is that's currently where we at, and that would be a great I, idea to to have it created if you can do your baseline work at your local clinic um, and make sure that the doctor currently sees you can write your prescription. So I hope we can get to that point soon. Okay, because that's what I was um, going to ask about because I was also thinking over to we can, you know, do all the blood works here with him and then send everything through to you guys and then maybe we can have like a Zoom interaction or engagement and then, you know, we can hopefully get to the medication. But thank you so much for your clarity. My pleasure, dear. I must say, um, based based on a lot of what's been said, I feel that something we have to remember in the South African context is that for many trans people, this pandemic has taken away our options to access gender affirming care, but for many, many more, um, nothing has changed in terms of access. Um, when you think about the fact that the majority of specialized endocrinologists uh, are based in urban centers. Many of them charge exorbitant fees because they're in private practice. Um, regardless of the pandemic, uh, we need to remember that gender affirming care as, it's, as it has always stood is not always accessible. Um, me, the other day I went for blood tests and that cost me around 1,800 Rand. Um, and unless you're on a relatively high, relatively stable medical aid, uh, they won't cover a lot of the charges of a lot of the cost of blood tests, especially if your gender marker hasn't been amended because the medical aid will say, well, this particular blood test is not for someone of your legal gender. So uh, the doctor must've made a mistake. We're not gonna pay for it. 1,800 Rand for many people is just, it's not an option. Uh, so I'm very glad, even though, understandably, uh, it's tough going at the moment or in the early stages, I'm very glad to hear that Vits RHI is building something, is, is, is working to create something. And I also think, perhaps if I'm trying to find a silver lining out of all of this, um, you know, we talk about uh, virtual meetings, Skyping into a doctor rather than having to travel all the way to Johannesburg from uh, the free state to find someone willing to treat you. Um, this world we're living in right now has shown us that, you know, meeting in person in order to share ideas, in order to talk, in order to engage with one another is not always necessary. So hopefully uh, post pandemic, uh, digital technology and the coping me mechanisms that we've all come up with uh, during the pandemic will stay, you know, in our toolkit, as it were, and add to the collective 
easing and increased access of gender affirming care. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to let uh, people ask one or two more questions. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll begin wrapping up. And if there's no question in the next minute or so, I'm going to hand off to Kanisile to close, if that's okay. And by questions, uh, comments, statements, uh, it doesn't have to be a question. Uh, this is a space of dialogue. Uh, please excuse my, my poor speaking skills. Uh, I'm okay, can you see it's not closing? Uh, is closing. Uh, I'm Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, man. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, like uh, all of you, to me, this topic is very much um, close. You, you know, it's personal. Um, uh, when we grew up, when I grew up, um, activists used to say personal is political because it doesn't only affect you alone, it affects many other people. So, you know, I wish, I wish we had a movement, a trans movement, in a true sense of a movement. You know, more than just having, you know, NGOs, I wish we had people on the ground who could, you know, challenge the status quo. I mean, in the same way that in South Africa, we saw different groupings. I mean, recently it was the uh, restaurant owners saying, you know, to hell with these regulations, we want to open up. Uh, we saw other groups, and um, I think on the news this morning, they were interviewing the guys from the gym. They're saying, we want gyms to open up. You know, if, if, if we had a movement, you know, we, we would, you know, gather and, you know, we would organize ourselves to say to hell with this thing that all the time, um, anything or uh, services that are supposed to be for trans and, and gender diverse people and intersex people are considered, you know, not a priority. To hell with that because, you know, much as, you know, um, much as, uh, you know, delaying my transition, I would not die from that. But say, for instance, in a case like uh, in my situation where I'm already on hormones and I have side effects from these hormones, right? And my blood is, is, is thickening. And um, when your blood is thickening, then you, it can clot. If it clots, then you will have a heart attack or or stroke or something, you know. Um, but now you can't go to the the, the, the gender clinic at, at, the, at the hospital. As SMS me and said um, your your appointment has been cancelled due to COVID nineteen. You know. So as much as they think it's not important, it is important to me because I can die today if my blood clots. You you see what I'm saying? And therefore, I want to urge us. You know, I want, I want us to transform, I, I'm angry. I want us, I'm frustrated. If we could, you know, convert our, um, our anger and frustration into activism to challenge, you know, to challenge the status quo, because it cannot be that all the time, wait a minute, let's save everybody else. Wait a minute, this is not urgent. It cannot be, it cannot continue like that. You know, I, I, I just wish we could mobilize ourselves and, and start speaking out about these things um, and, and hopefully we'll be heard in the same way that we've seen in South Africa, we've seen the government adjusting regulations to accommodate um, restaurant owners, to accommodate all kinds of, of, of sectors. And anyway, uh, uh, it's just that I'm angry, so now I'm talking a lot. But but I want to thank the speakers for you know for um, sharing their insight 
on this um, important topic because we can do all things, but if we do not have health, uh, then it's all in vain. So for me, health has always been a priority and it still is. And um, so I thank the speakers for sharing their insight. Um, um, the speakers uh, from outside South Africa, I want to appreciate your input. And I hope um, what Job was talking about, it plants a seed that we really, really need to, you know, go beyond our borders. You know, um, I want to appreciate um, uh, the speakers from Vets, Vets, Vets uh, RHI for their input and, you know, uh, showing us possibilities that these things can be done. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the um, people who managed to join us. Uh, so we have, um, uh, some of you will know, we have every second week, I'm sure uh, GDX will circulate and even in our Facebook pages, we'll circulate uh, the next um, webinar uh, that's taking place, I think in two weeks time. But at the same time, uh, there is um, a survey that we are conducting. Please, when you are being approached, please uh, participate in the survey because the survey is looking at how uh, COVID-19 has impacted um, trans, um, trans health healthcare. So I urge you to all participate in the survey and I thank you very much for your presence um, in this webinar and your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful, wonderful Tuesday. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs>